what is Filipino cuisine? What is Filipino cuisine in the U.S.? It's it's a shifting thing, right? And so there are periods, and it's like like part of it, like I, I mentioned in, in my first book, Arsene Agro, the ideas of like what is authentic mm-hmm. and the idea of like, of, of like authenticity. The question isn't what is Filipino food, but how does a food become Filipino? Mm-hmm. Welcome to Proudly Asian, a podcast series that tells bold and proud stories of Asians by Asians. I'm Isabel Wong, a financial journalist who wants to uncover the many Asian stories around us that are waiting to be told. There's never just one way to look at Asians. This podcast will take you through a deep dive into the life stories, struggles and triumphs of young Asians around the world. On today's episode, we have Mia P. Manansala, the author of the multi-award-winning Tita Rosie's Kitchen Mystery Series. Growing up in a Filipino-American household in Chicago, Mia joins us to talk about exploring aspects of the Filipino diaspora through her books, the creative writing process of her cozy mystery series, and the essence of Filipino cuisine. Welcome back to Proudly Asian. Now, this month, we are rolling out another edition of Proudly Asian Food Month, talking to our guests from around the world about the food and cuisines that they grew up eating and what we can learn about different Asian cultures through their cuisines. So for those who have been around for quite a while, you will remember that last July, we first launched Proudly Asian Food Month, where we got to talk about cuisines like Burmese food, Lao, Tibetan food, and all. So for those who haven't checked it out, feel free to check out the episodes from last July. But this week, as the return of the Proudly Asian Foods Month limited series, I am so glad that we are going to talk all about Filipino cuisine, which is one of my favorite Asian cuisines ever. And I'm so glad to be bringing in Mia, who is the author of Tita Rosie's Kitchen Mystery Series, who integrates her love for Filipino cuisine into her writing. So thank you so much for joining us on Proudly Asian Mia, how are you doing? <laughs> yeah, thank you for having me. I'm all right. I love how in your background you already have um, one of your books poster, and then somehow because like the colors of Proudly Asian is purple and yellow, somehow your wall is purple and you're wearing a yellow top. So this is such a fantastic setting for this episode. But before we get started with the whole conversation about how you created your book series and your favorite Filipino dishes, I would like to start off with the basic. Which are some of the mm-hmm. questions that I ask every single guest of mine on Proudly Asian, which is basically tell us about your background. Who are you? What are you? And where did you grow up, Mia? Sure. So um, again, I'm Mia P. Malansala, you she, her pronouns. And I was born and raised in Chicago to uh, immigrant parents. I grew up in a majority Latina working class neighborhood in a multi generational household. So I grew up in my maternal grandparents' house. Uh, with, you know, so my grandparents, my parents, me, my brothers, two cousins, sometimes an aunt or an uncle or kind of that immigrant experience where like if people were coming to the U.S., they would kind of stay with us for a little while till it got stable and then they would kind of go out on their own. So I didn't have a big Filipino community growing up. I only had my family. Um, and so sometimes even when it comes to I'm sure we'll talk about it more later. But, you know, speaking of culture, when it comes to Filipino culture, there are these like gaps, some things that I know very, very well and some things I don't to the point where like I'll have to message my mom when I'm writing something and be like, all right, mommy, is this like a Filipino thing or is this like our family thing? Uh, Because I don't want to make those kinds of assumptions, you know? (laughs) That's amazing. Wow. So what you're mentioning is that in Chicago, there actually um, isn't a huge Filipino American community at all. There is, but Chicago is a very segregated city. Um, but while lots of other cultures have like these large enclaves, so like there, like obviously there's a Chinatown, right? There's a Korea town. Uh, there's like Argyle, which is like where we're mostly Vietnamese. Um, there are areas that are mostly black or Puerto Rican or all these kinds of things. But Filipinos in the in Chicago, as far as I know, tend to be kind of scattered. So there there is a very large population, but there's not one neighborhood you would travel to be like, oh, I'm really craving Filipino food. Let's hit up this one area where we could try lots of them. It's 
it's a little bit more scattered. Wow. Okay. Then I'm curious about your growing up experience in a Filipino American household in Chicago. Like, what was it like for you? What are some of the examples where you are not sure if it's a Filipino thing or if it's a family thing? Could you give us some examples? And also, growing up, what was breakfast like for you? Sure. So, um, so they never taught us the Galug. My because we grew up in a majority Latina neighborhood, it was mostly Spanish speaking. Um, and our our the, our neighborhood schools didn't really have a lot of resources to help things out. Like my parents thought that they would give me and my brothers a leg up if they if they only spoke in English, so that we would have an easier time in school and not have to worry about language switching and things like that. So I can understand the Galug just because my parents and grandparents spoke it to each other growing up, but I can't speak it. So the, for example, you know when I would go to the Philippines to visit family, I went there as an adult. People would speak to me in Tagalog, and I would answer in English, and they would understand. And there was that we, you know, but there was like a slight few seconds where we're all trying to translate in our heads before we answer, but we would communicate in two different languages just fine, and that's kind of how it was a lot. Um, when it comes to things, I'm like, oh, is this Filipino? Is this my family? Something I talked about to someone recently was. Someone on Twitter, like a, a person, I'm, a writer I'm an acquaintances with, wanted to know like superstitions from, from like different cultures and things like that. And one of the things that I didn't know until other people chimed in, like, no, no, that's a Filipino thing. I was like, I don't know if this was just my grandmother, but she never let us go to sleep with our hair wet. Like, so if we took a shower at night and we washed our hair, we weren't allowed to go to sleep with it wet because she said we'd go blind. Uh, so we so we always had to dry our hair before bed so we didn't lose our eyesight. And I was like, is that, was that just grandma? Or was that, you know, I, but like other people chimed in like, no, 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 I've heard that before too. So, but that was just one of those things because I didn't really have like a lot of other Filipino people around until maybe like high school and later on. Mm -hmm. I yeah. thought that one was kind of like an Asian thing because like growing up in a culturally Chinese family or Cantonese, right? I've heard from my grandma saying something similar, but then the consequence was completely different, which is like if we go to bed with our hair wet, like we would get like headaches or something like that instead mm -hmm. of losing eyesight, which is I know, I'm like, okay, like you'll get sick. I'm like, I'm, I'm, okay, there are some things that you can maybe connect, but go blind? Like I, I was like a little extreme, but you know, we were kids, we're like, okay, grandma, and we'll just dry our hair before we we go to bed. <laughs> That's funny. And just as a follow-up question, what was um breakfast like for you? Did you grow up with traditional Filipino breakfast, like different types mm -hmm. of sea log? On the weekends. Like, so like, you know, during, so during the week, um, cooking was usually my grandmother or like sometimes me after school, like baking, because I'm, I'm the oldest in the family. So like I would, you know, have like make the afternoon snacks for my brothers and things like that and help out with like small stuff. My mom, bless her, not a cook. <laughs> <laughs> but you know my father my father was the cook in the family he's the one who taught me about food and how to love food and all these different things you know but he worked really really long hours during the week he he would make feasts on the weekends where my grandmother kind of handled like the day-to-day -day kind of stuff so you know during the week you know there were at any point in time three to five kids that have to get ready for school of varying ages so it'd be you know a really quick like american style like eat a bowl of cereal, we got to go, you know, <laughs> or make us, you know, uh, eat some leftovers, we have to go. Uh, but on the weekend, my dad would make this love with like the garlic fried rice, you know, the different kinds of eggs, depending on how people like it. Um, my favorite growing up was the sardines, which was kind of a hard sell to people. <laughs> like the sardines and the tomato sauce with onions and garlic, that, like that was usually my favorite. Obviously like longanisa and like that kind of a thing. Um, but yeah, that was like more of a Saturday, Sunday kind of a feast as opposed to like an everyday occurrence. I see that just now when you're describing your growing up experience, I was already kind of like drawing some references from basically that were kind of mentioned in the book. But I'm definitely like so curious about talking about, you know, the books that you have written so far. But before we get to that, I'm also curious in terms of your professional career as a book author, how did it all start for you? Did you always know that you wanted to write books? I always knew I loved writing and I always knew that, you know, I, I had a little bit of skill with it, but I didn't consider it a career for a very, very long time. Um, I mean, I did study, Eng like English was my major in university, but that's more like academic writing that leans towards more to the teaching side as opposed to the creative side. I didn't take a creative writing class until uh, I was an adult. I was in, you know, in 2015. I remember when I took my very first creative writing class. And um, what led me there is that, so after I graduated college, I spent three and a half years teaching English in South Korea. And I had an amazing time. You know, I learned a lot about myself. And then, you know, I had so many adventures traveling to all these different places. 
And then I went home and <laughs> I was almost 30 years old, living with my parents again, doing the same thing at a dead end job, hanging out with the same people. And I had a bit of like a quarter life crisis, which feels a little silly, right? Because, you know, now that I'm like past 30, <laughs> I'm further away from 30 than I am close to 30. I'm like, oh, 30 is great. It's fine. But at the time I was just like, oh, no, is this is this it? <laughs> is this all there is? And um, and that's when I remembered how much I loved writing because I gave it up in college because I had so much other reading, you know, academic reading and writing to do that, that my creative life kind of fell to the wayside. And so I was like, all right, you know, let me do something for myself. I literally just Googled Chicago writing class and like, let's see what we got. <laughs> and um, writing classes are expensive, but I was able to find a one day mystery writing workshop. And I didn't I didn't think I was going to become a mystery writer, but I always loved watching and reading mysteries so again like multi-generational household I was a little kid watching like Matlock and Perry Mason and Murder She Wrote with my grandparents you know uh, my mom got me into like Nancy Drew Encyclopedia Brown like later on Mary Higgins Clark so I grew up loving mysteries but I never thought I would write it until I took that class and that class it sounds very ingrained but that class changed my life it really did Wow. So it's kind of like coming into a like full circle for you, you know, now that you are creating a mystery series that you never planned on doing. So I want to dive a little bit deeper into Tita Rosie's Kitchen Mystery, which uh, I mean, for everyone's information, I love, love, love <laughs> reading those books. I'm I'm on to book three. I'm not done yet, but I <laughs> absolutely love the first two books. I kind of just finished reading them both within like a few weeks time. <laughs> they are both really like page turners. And as many people would describe, it's a really cozy mystery series where mm -hmm. you wouldn't mind reading before before you go to bed. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to quickly get a bit of background from you because it's the writing class that kind of got you started to think about writing, you know, some sort of like mystery books, right? But how did the entire idea of Tita Rosie's Kitchen come about? So, you know, we mentioned Cozy Mystery, which, you know, uh, a lot of people have never heard of before. So, you know, I just wanted to like quickly explain like Cozy Mystery. Like if you're American, maybe you'll get this reference and I'll give other references if you're not an American listener. Um, I like to refer to them as like Hallmark movies with dead bodies, which is like um, there is no graphic violence, sex or bad language on the page. I literally wrote a book that I could, that, you know, that my mom could read without me being like, oh, don't read page. You know, like like where I'd be like a little worried about that. Um, so yeah, like you could read it before bed. They're meant to be like light, fluffy beach reads. Like even though, yes, there's a dead body, I don't go into detail about it. There's no nothing too scary about, you know, um, they're meant to be like feel good uh, where you enjoy the the puzzle of a mystery, but none of like the scary, gruesome factor. Um, and, you know, speaking of my mom, she's the one who got me into cozy mysteries. So my mom works at a, a library here in Chicago. She's a page. The people who like shelve the books. And so one day she was shelving the books because she works in the, the fiction section. And she was like, oh, uh, Chocolate Chip Cookie Murder. What's this about? Which is a book by Joanne Fluke, who is a popular cozy mystery writer. Um, and at the time, we didn't know that there were books that combined our love of mystery, which was like our favorite thing to read, and our love of food. Right. Like, yeah, like my mom doesn't cook, but we eat. <laughs> <laughs> and so she found this series. We started buddy reading it. Right. Because we don't have a ton in common, but we do really love mystery. So we started reading the series together to have something to talk about. And and so I was like, oh, wow, I can't believe there's books like this. So I looked and I started reading just dozens and dozens of different series within this subgenre of mystery. And they were so much fun. But I just I never saw myself in them. Right. I never saw a character that seemed like me. I never saw a world that reflected the one that I saw. And I knew one day I wanted to put my own spin on, on a culinary cozy mystery, because like what better way to, you know, marry um, the importance of food to a mystery than having like a Filipino protagonist. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious because like from the background and other lived experiences and examples that you have mentioned so far, I could definitely hear like some similarities between your own experiences and the experiences of some of the characters in the book series. So how much of that character development process was pretty much drawn from your own lived experience? So... I wanted her to be very different. So Arsenic and Adobo, which is the poster behind me, like that's my debut. That was the first novel I ever got published, but it wasn't the first book I ever wrote. It's not the first one I finished. So the mystery writing class that I took, the idea that got started there, the one that got me put on my path, it got me 
grants. It got me my first, you know, it got me my mentorship. It got me my first literary agent. That one was called Death Comes to Comic Con, which featured a queer Filipino American millennial solving a murder mystery at Chicago Comic Book Convention. And that character was very much me. It was my first book. It was me learning the process. It was me learning myself. And I still am very proud of that book, but I am also, I know myself well enough to know that there's a lot of that. Where it's almost like a self-insert character. Not quite Mary Sue, but I'm like, okay, this is me figuring out who I am and it, through this story. And I didn't want that for this book. I kind of tried as much as possible to make us different because I wanted to stretch myself and see, like, I don't want people to be like, oh, she's Filipino. Clearly it's Mia. Like, it's exactly like, no, I wanted her to be a very separate character. But of course, there are elements of me in there. Some, some, some I purposely put in, like the multi-generational household uh, and certain other experiences, the fish out of the big fish in a small pond kind of a feeling. Um, because I wanted to be able to relate to her on a certain level, but in, in many important ways, I had us diverge. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there were certain things where I was like, okay, she is growing up in this fictional small town outside of Chicago where I grew up in the big city most of my, but I grew up in a, a, a certain kind of neighborhood. I mentioned working class, majority Latina. Um, a lot of people, most, you know, most people in that area didn't have a lot of money. It was considered like a big deal if you made it out of high school without getting pregnant. You know, like it, it was the idea of being a big fish in a small pond. Like there has to be more than this, right? Like I, I have to be able to do bigger things. And, you know, it was a very snobby mindset at the time. But I remember, again, myself at that age, I remember thinking that. And so I was like, okay, her in this majority white small town where there there is like a large you know, ethnic population, but she's still in this very small town close to a big city. And in her mind, she would want to get away because she thinks she's destined to bigger things. So I kind of had that, that, that idea, like the yearning that I had in my youth mm -hmm. and I gave her that. And then I wanted to see how it would diverge in which ways it would show up for her. Yeah. That's amazing. And I'm definitely thinking that for maybe like readers who are in the same age group as the main character, Leela, they could probably relate to a lot of that feelings that she was going through as in like not really sure what's ahead, but also trying to like discover or actually appreciate being around family again. Mm -hmm. So I think like there's always that whole phase of like you want to be away from the family, but eventually you appreciate spending <laughs> time with them. But I'm curious about during the whole writing process, were there any particular challenges that you had oh lots <laughs> so with like well with my previous some of it was is like creative craft like this is something I need to learn on my own and get through some of it is like the mental challenge of like right just the creative life in general is very very hard so having my community help me along and some of it's the industry you know it's it's a slow to change so with that first book that I mentioned Death Comes to Comic Con I always like to bring it up because it got me so far in all those accolades and then when my agent my first agent tried to sell it uh, for a year and a half, we was getting rejections and three times it got close. And most people don't really know how many yeses you need for, for a book to get published. So like I had my agent, I had editors who wanted to take me on, but the editors have to convince the sales team at the, at the publishing companies, right? Because writing is an art, but publishing is a business. And so three times I got really close and three times the sales team said, no, they said, um, She's not a good investment. She has no audience. People are not going to read her books. Uh, one went so far as to say, you know, she has a great voice, but traditional mystery is for older white women. Uh, nobody's going to buy this book. You know, someone people told me to, I should be writing YA instead because YA is where diversity is. You know, so like things like that. And this was like 2018, 2019. It was not that long ago. Um, so when I was writing, well, so while I was getting rejections on that first book, I started writing the next one because you have to keep on moving um so the book that would become arsenic and adobo you know i finished it after about a year and a half gave it to my first agent she didn't like it uh we amicably parted ways she she was looking out for me she really was every time every time i say it people are like oh and like it hurt but she was right we had both reached the point where we were no longer seeing eye to eye in our vision for my career and she told me like you deserve someone who is going to champion you someone who loves your work um, I, I don't think I can do that right now. Uh, so, you know, it's probably better that we split. I'm like, yeah, we should split. Uh, so, you know, but I was able to sign on with my sec, my, my second and now current agent. She was able to sell Arsenic and Adobo in two weeks, which is like unheard of <laughs> at auction. So, you know, I, I went from, you know, a year and a half of being told I had no audience and nobody wanted to read 
my work to, you know, multiple publishing houses being interested within like weeks. Um, timing, uh, it, you know, circumstance, it's just, it's two to three years is really not that much time, but it was enough for the industry to shift and realize like, hey, maybe we shouldn't be shutting out these like other voices. Maybe it's, we need to be expanding our ideas of what tradition mystery is and can be. Wow. I mean, thank God um, the second book agent <laughs> took on the book series. And now I'm a really happy reader that I got to like have these fun books to read. And just from what you're mentioning, it definitely sounded like a very long and challenging process just to get this published. But were there any points where you felt like maybe the fact that, you know, like, because I know a lot of Asian American authors, they would have been told that, hey, your book is too Asian. It's not going to attract a larger crowd. Have you ever had that feeling where maybe someone was telling you that your writing was a bit too niche to AAPI to Asian? Well, the first book, that's what it was. Mm. They said, you know, like I checked too many boxes, right? My protagonist was like, again, yeah, like it was almost like, right? she's like, she was queer and Filipino-American and a millennial, right? And so like, you know, she wasn't straight. She wasn't in the age category that these traditional mysteries usually were. She wasn't white, which is what, the, you know, as again, as someone very loudly said, older white women, with the audience like I was told um again I, if I wanted diversity I should be writing YA mm -hmm. you know <laughs> like young adults basically for the teens um you know there are people like not with the, like my critique but they're it's like like why does she have to be Filipino and it's like well I don't know I didn't get a choice like why, why can't she be like what did like why why not but, like, but with us and like an adobo I got very so like my I have two editors a senior editor and a more junior editor and they're both women of color um, my my head editor, the one who took me on, uh, is a Latina woman, and my junior editor, the one I work with mostly, because she, you know, like the the senior editor was the one who who was able to acquire me, but she's like, I want you to work really closely with this. She's now um, no longer junior; she has her own blip. But at the time, she was like, I really want you to work with her. She's Korean American, not Filipino, but she's an Asian American millennial like you. I think she will be able to help you find your voice in your work in a way that that even I can't where I can help you with a more mystery aspect mm. and so with these two you know both of them were very very supportive in helping me find my voice and, and being like no like absolutely not you you should not be toning these things down because that's what makes your book different mm -hmm. you know like maybe like maybe they'll, they'll might be like well maybe you can explain it this way or like you shouldn't ha like they'll be like here you don't have to explain it don't worry but in other areas, they're like, well, I can see where some people might get confused. So can you like using the context, mm -hmm. explain it as something else? But they would never be like, no, don't don't be don't be too Filipino. Like, that's not what they're looking for. I see. So I've been very lucky with those added. Other ones <laughs> might be a little different. But with my particular editors now, they are wonderful. I'm very happy with them. I see. Right. So now going back to the book series, you have actually created a lot of really likable characters, some of my favorite book characters, I would say. So I'm just really curious to hear from you, the creator of these really lovely characters, if the book series gets a chance of being made into movies. I'm so curious to hear from you, like who you would cast for the main characters, for example, like Leela, Jay, Adina, Elena, Tita Rosie, of course, and Lola, you know, some of my favorite characters. So every time I get asked, I'm always like, oh, no. Um, well, because one, like, I don't watch a ton of, so, I, so I'm not, like, familiar with as many. And then also, you know, I have a majority minority, like, you know, in the U.S. ethnic minority cast. So it's, like, it's a very limited pool. Um, I, you know, with Lila, particularly with Lila, um, and it, it's pronounced Lila or Lila, like, in case people are wondering, like, why we're saying it two different ways. It is even mentioned in the first book, you know. Um, Lila is her Americanized pronunciation, right? Like with the, the Filipino family, especially of the older generation, they pronounce it Lila. Um, but she, you know, teachers and things like that would always call her Lila and she just didn't fight it. So she, she goes by both. And in my head, it goes both ways as well. Mm -hmm. Um, but with her, like with her, like I would actually want it to be kind of like an unknown, uh, one, because most of the actresses in Hollywood that are that are somewhat known that are Filipino are of mixed descent. And not that they're like less, like not that you're like, oh, they don't count. Of course they count. There's like, I'm not, you know, we're not talking percentages. That doesn't make sense. These are whole people. Um, but like I, you know, when I was talking to the cover design, you know, the when they asked me like, things on the cover, and I was like, you know, one of the things I was adamant about was like, if you are going to put my character on the cover, 
I want it to be clear that she's a brown Asian, right? She's Southeast Asian, right? When people do like a vague Asian thing, it's, it's almost always East Asian. I'm like, I am clearly not East Asian, <laughs> you know? Um, I like, you know, and I wanted it to be clear um, doing what she was. So I think for a brown skinned, you know, Filipino lead, um, it is something I would really want. And off the top, like there might actually be an actress out there who is already, you know, killing it and doing great, but I don't watch that much. So I, I, I don't know. Um, the one thing I could think of off the top of my head, like, oh, wow, this is a big ask. But in the second book, there is a teenager who is of mixed Filipino and white descent, a joy. And I was like, oh, Olivia Rodrigo, what's up? And by the time it's done, she'll probably, she'll have like way aged out of that. <laughs> but at the time, after I had written and someone asked me, I was like, ooh. Um, if we did have the someone who was like a little bit more well known, I I also do really oh geez I'm blanking on her name it, it was in my head and I forgot it she played she, she was the original Eurydice in Hades Town uh, she was in the movie Yellow Rose she's an amazing singer mixed Filipina actress oh geez I can't remember it will come to me later and I'm gonna have to like email you like her name is this um, well now people are gonna Google <laughs> oh I feel so bad because like some um, Eva Noblezada. I, I might be mispronouncing her name, but yes, she's a fantastic actress and singer. She does Broadway and theater and all that kind of stuff, but she also acts in movies and, and things like that. Um, she's great. When I when I first started writing, uh, like I was thinking, uh, for, like for the J character, I was like, oh, Daniel Henney. But I'm like, oh no, like I'm older, so now Daniel Henney is older, so now he's like a silver fox, so he'd probably be more like the detective part. Right. Character, right? Um, because the, the Park brothers are also both mixed, uh, Korean and white. Uh, so I'm like, okay, that would be a good fit for Tita Rosie. I don't know. Maybe like Leia Salonga. Like, I feel like <laughs> if you have a Filipino thing, like you got to get Leia Salonga in there somewhere, right? Like you can't not have her around. That's true. Yeah. You know, things like, things like that. <laughs> what about Lola Flor? <laughs> oh man. <laughs> She's quite a character. <laughs> yeah, like because, because you know, finding an older actress like that would be a little bit. There is one. Oh man, the thing is, I don't think she's Filipino. I think she, but she's played a Filipino before. I cannot remember her name. I want to say her first name is Amy. She's played. Um, I like on Crazy Ex Girlfriend. She was Josh's mom, which is so she was playing like a Filipino, uh, older woman character. Oh, geez, what is her name? But she's definitely done like the older, sassy, mm. <laughs> um, like really tough, you know, Asian mom, grandmother thing before. So I feel like she would fit in that role to kind of like just off the top of my head. I'm not trying to spoil the book for everyone, but then one of my favorite moments of Lola was um, when she served that dinner full of Tita Rosie's friends. Like all of the dishes were like something that she disliked. And I laughed so hard <laughs> when reading that part. I'm like, I didn't know you could be salty like this. <laughs> oh, the petty. Yes. It was like petty on another level. It's like, it looks like hospitality on the outside because you're cooking these delicious things. But she made sure that like each dish was something that this one person in particular hated. And they're just like, oh, it was great. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's one of my favorite moments. Um, but do you get that a lot that people will always tell you Jay is one of the favorite characters? He's such a sweetheart. Well, I get a lot of books. A lot of people will ask me, like, are you Team Amir or Team Jay? And like, I can't say anything yet because like, to be honest, so I, you know, I sold this series as a three book series. So and after that, I didn't know if there were going to be any more, right? Like, I was the debut. We ha we had no idea what the reception was going to be. So when people ask, like, oh, do you know how it's going to end? I'm like, I don't even know how many books I'm going to get. So I always do. So I think it's like mini arcs. So with this first contract, with these first three books, um, I wanted that last book. If it turned out to be the last in the series, which thankfully it's not. But if it was, I wanted to have a feeling of completeness, mm -hmm. but open a door to more. So particularly with like the romance subplot, you know, in the first book, uh, a love trial is introduced in book two. She's like clearly leaning a particular way. Mm. Um, and in the third book, a decision has been made. So, like, I'm not going to drag that one out. Yeah. So in the third one, it's clear that she made a decision. But I didn't want to sway readers one way or another because like that's their own experience. You know, I want them. I have a particular favorite. <laughs> I think it's obvious when you read the second one that I think is good for her. 
but it, it's actually really fun hearing other people say like why they think one is better for her than the other. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I, I really, I really like them both, but for very different reasons. Yes, I'm, I'm so eager to find out. I'm still in the middle of reading book three, and yeah, so <laughs> please don't spoil that for me. But I know particularly for book two. The atmosphere was actually quite different from book one. It was a, a little bit more serious. One might say it's slightly darker mentally, mm-hmm. especially for Leela's personal experience. And I also remember reading the note um, in the beginning of the book that you were saying, like you were sort of writing this book during the pandemic. So, you know, how did that play into maybe the slightly mm-hmm. darker tone of book two? So it, like, it was two prong actually, like why I went that route. So with cozy mysteries, they are meant to be standalones, right? You know, I don't drop a book, a dead body in one book and then solve the mystery later on. They are all self-contained. Um, like if you'll notice, like the books aren't even numbered, which I find frustrating as a reader because I like reading in order. But for marketing reasons, they want you to be able to pick up book 15, having never read the others, and you still are able to get a full story and enjoy it. And then maybe you'll want to go read the others. Like that's the idea. And I know that. And I understand that. And so when I was writing the sequel, I I tried to have it as complete and not connected to the first book as possible. We're obviously like it's the same characters and there'll be some growth and things that carry over, but I didn't want to make it too dependent on the first book for for you to be able to understand it. Um which meant not referencing the things that she went through in the first book and which which you know, I get I've read not even exaggerating, probably close at least like a hundred cozies by you know over the years, and like none of them really like they'll touch on a previous case, but not necessarily the emotion that and, and the trauma that comes with it, because again like these are meant to be fun fluffy reads. PTSD is not a fun fluffy topic, but I was struggling while writing that second book so much. Part of it is just the regular like second book syndrome, right? The first book I had all the time in the world to write and make it good. You know, it took me the, a year and a half to finish the first book, not even like revise and make it like, but like even the like finished draft was a year and a half. With book two, I was on contract. I, I was not only revising the first book, I was also writing the second one at the same time. And I had to write that book in six months, you know, roughly. Um, and so, you know, there was a lot of that going on. It was in 2020, <laughs> you know, where all that was going on. I had just gotten laid off from my job because I, I taught English at an international language school. No international students. Right. So there was things going on in my personal life. There was things going on in the world. But there was also things going on in Lila's world. Mm-hmm. And I, I realized one of the reasons I kept hitting creative roadblocks was because I was because um, like one of the things people ask like oh are you a plotter or a pantser as in like do I plot and outline do I know who the killer is do I know certain scenes ahead of time or do I write by the seat of my pants do I just sit down and figure it out I am mostly a plotter because I have to be because the turnaround is so fast and so like I knew what was supposed to happen and I kept trying to write those things that were supposed to happen without acknowledging the events of the first book and my, you know, this sounds really woo woo, but like Lila wouldn't let me, she like, it, it felt so flat. It wouldn't move anywhere because I wasn't understanding my character enough to make the story, you know, uh, feel real. Um, Cause you know, people think of mysteries as plot driven, right? Like, Oh, you're solving a murder. That's, that's what the book is about. But for me, a good series is character driven, right? Like that's why you pick up book after book after book Not just like, oh, the plots are so fun, but because this is a character you want to spend time with or it's a world that you find interesting. And so for me, developing those aspects are a little bit more important than the mystery aspect, which some people like and some don't, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which is fair, right? It's fair. Um, uh, Fair criticism. I I fully accept that. Um, So when I'm like, okay, let's forget what I'm supposed to be writing, how I'm not supposed to reference anything from the first book where is she right now in her life where is she mentally what's happening to her what is driving her actions um because it timeline wise book two takes place like three months <laughs> like after the events of the first right the our second and adobo happens in the spring homicide and halo halo is in the summer right it's not like years have passed and she's had time to kind of figure it out like everything in her world has been shaken up from like breaking up with her fiance to moving back to town to solve it. So she's in this really unsteady state of mind. And I thought like, oh, I'm having mental health issues. Clearly she's going through some things. Maybe 
part of the theme of this book can be like the the, the stigma of mental health, you know, in the Asian American, like, you know, like people in general, but particularly within the Asian American community. And so when I thought like how I could lean into that and weave it into the book and make it part of her journey um, and also have it tie into the mystery as well, because it does actually weave into the mystery plot of like, like certain decisions that she makes and certain suspects she overlooks because of that. Um, it just felt so much more natural, not easy, but I was like, I get what the story is supposed to be now in a way that I hadn't when I wasn't allowing myself to touch on the darker aspects because I kept trying so hard to keep it fluffy and fun and it's not always <laughs> fluffy and fun. Like there's still jokes, right? Like there's still moments of happiness and lightness. Um, but book two is almost like a transition book for her. Uh, and so I felt like I had to respect mm -hmm. what she was going through as a character at that time in her life. Uh, if I didn't want to do that, I would have had to choose a very different, completely, you know, time and setting. And again, that still did not feel real. Yeah, I'm really glad that you went that path because in a way, it's just like I jumped into the second book right after the first book. So it's basically maybe like I was also kind of mentally maybe processing what I just read in the first <laughs> book. And at the same time, Leela was also going through the same thing. So in a way, it's really, really nice to be spending that time with her from like ups to a little bit of downs. You know, like I remember reading the second book. I was also feeling a bit low because of what I was reading and I was like, like, oh it's just like so interesting it's kind of like going through ups and downs with this character it just makes readers feel a lot closer to this character right but the other very important aspect of the books is that you feature a lot of creative and delicious Filipino and Asian inspired <laughs> recipes I just wish they were real or like there was a chance for me <laughs> to actually like get my hands on some of that coconut water based coffee or even the baked snacks so can you tell us a little bit about how you created those recipes or did you already bake or make those drinks in real life some of them yes so all the so there are recipes at the back of the book each book has four recipes and some of them were things that i had already made before like the ube crinkles in the first one which are probably like my most popular recipe still today they're very instagrammable so i think people like taking pictures of these you know bright purple ube cookies um i had actually made those before and i was like oh i know that this would be like a nice bridge um, with, with, with Filipino American fusion, you know, kind of a recipe. And then other things I was like, oh, what would I want to try? You know, like I like before, like obviously with the first book, I had made adobo before. Um, the, the coconut jam that Lola Flor, you know, the, uh, that's her recipe. I've ha I've tasted it before, but I've never made it, but I've seen recipes and it's so simple. I was like, okay, I want to try this. Whereas other things, you know, it's my favorite way to procrastinate. Like I have a Google doc, which is like, list of all the different foods that I want to try to make like I'll never have all the time in the world to create it but like it's really fun to dream um and it's also the I get to tell myself like oh I'm not procrastinating I'm researching right like oh yes I need three dozen cookies for research <laughs> you know because for, for every book um so that's actually one of my like favorite things to be. like right now with book five because I'm, I'm currently writing book five um I, can't, I keep having to like stop myself because like I'll I'll describe a thing I'm like oh dang that sounds good does someone made this yet and like and I'll go and like I'll stop and start to Google and I have to be like no go back to writing you can look that up later so with things so, like sometimes it's like I will take something I already know works and kind of tweak it like you know like I, like I know this cookie base works let me mix with the flavors in a different way. Um, other times I like, I will look, um, online for inspiration because mostly like for proportions, right? Because like, I don't necessarily know, particularly like I love baking, but that's not something where I'm like, I'll just throw these things in and like, and like cross my fingers, you know, like I'm not super precise, but I do want a baseline. And then I'll be like, okay, what has someone else done? Okay, cool. That's my starting point. And then what if I add this? What if I do this? Oh, I don't really like this texture. Maybe mess with, you know, I'll fiddle with the oven temperature and then th do things like that. You know, I will have to caveat that, you know, I make these recipes in a home kitchen. So <laughs> these are based on how my stove and oven work. Hopefully <laughs> it works for everyone else. You know, I've heard mostly good things, but I also know people's ovens are different. Mm -hmm. So just 
FYI, I'm sorry if it turned out poorly for you. Actually, it's a really good way to procrastinate by like testing out recipes because at least you need few、um, while you were writing, right?、Mm-hmm. And I'm so curious about that Hello Hello cupcake. <laughs> Have you ever tried making that? No, like so. There are some things that I will put in that I know I will never try to make because I am not a fussy baker. Like, you know,、um, like that's why I was like, like there will never be a macaron recipe. Like that's one of the things I gave her that was mine. I was like, she loves the intricate, beautiful, carefully made things,、um, but I don't have the patience or the skill to do that.、Um, so you know, I'm a very like mix it up, chuck it in the oven kind of a person. So. Like those cupcakes seem really fiddly,、mm. and so I was like, "Ah,、oh, but I love the idea of them."、Yeah. So like I can mention it, and I won't put in a recipe. And if someone comes up with the recipe, I would be very glad to be like, "Oh, look at this amazing recipe <laughs> someone came up with." But like from like to make it myself, I was like, "Oh no, that sounds like a lot." <laughs> It sounds really fun. It's as if like you became like a cafe owner without actually having to run a shop because you're like basically developing like menus and recipe ideas, right? It sounds like a really fun process. Yeah, it's become it's a lot of like wish fulfillment. I'm、mm. like, yeah, it's like a cafe that has like fusion Filipino and Mexican and Pakistani, you know, goods and drinks, and there's like an herbal tea section, and there's plants, and you know, it was just like just me, and it's dog friendly, and it was just like me having so much fun, and people will be like, I wish this was real, and I'm like, me too. <laughs> I don't want to have to run it, but me too. I wish I could go there and write and enjoy all this deliciousness. No matter where that is, like if it becomes real, I'm definitely gonna travel all the way there. <laughs> but, <laughs> but since we are talking about foods, right? I'm also curious about just Filipino cuisine in general. For listeners who are not familiar with Filipino cuisine, can you run us through something about Filipino cuisine? What are your go-to dishes, and what are some of the most common ingredients in the cuisine? Oh man, it's always, when people ask me like, "Oh, like what are like the flavors of Filipino food?" And it's like it's really tough. Yeah.、Um, for multiple reasons, like you know, let's get to it. But like, I mean, food is political, right? <laughs> like, food is the way. Like, it's culture. It's it's your history. And sadly, the Philippines has a history of colonization, multiple times of colonization, right? So a lot of our food is Spanish influenced.、Mm. Uh, why? Because over three hundred years of that, you know, there are some dishes. That we have because of the U.S. occupation and the Japanese occupation, right? Halo, halo.、Um, I mean, like, don't like 100. Like, I'm not a food historian, but things that I've read, like, I know for sure the fact that we rely on canned goods so much is very much part of like the U.S. Army occupation. So, like, the fact that like a lot of our things, like, we love like spam,、mm. right? <laughs> Corned beef, Vienna sausages. That's something that like the Philippines and Puerto Rico like very much share <laughs> because of like the the similar like army occupation. Um, a lot of our desserts use like condensed milk and evaporated milk, right? Canned goods、uh, that are shelf stable in that kind of a heat. Halo,、uh, halo. Supposedly, I'm not sure if this is true. Is kind of like a mix between,、um, or like in the wartime, like Japanese kakigori, which is the shaved ice,、mm-hmm. and then like the 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 American like canned goods because it usually uses evaporated milk,、mm-hmm. and then, like the Filipino preserved like sweet fruits and beans and things that we use like the red bean. Um, the coconut, the macapuno, and stuff like that. So it's it's hard to talk about our food without being like we were colonized. So there's like a lot of different influences. You know, China is right there, which is a major trade route.、Um, it's Southeast Asia. So it's also it's an archipelago of like over seven thousand islands. It's a very long country. So it's like where in the Philippines, right? Where you live, changes the kind of food that you eat, right? If you're further south, like the more like means now, it's it's. More of what you think of as typical Southeast Asian, right? A lot of like coconut milk based things, a little bit spicier.、Um, my sister in law is from like Abigol, so that like there there are like some spicy things from there. My family is Tagalog, like we're、um, so like we have like I don't know what you think of like typical stuff, <laughs> like like our adobo is you know with vinegar, garlic, soy sauce, bay leaf. But there, that's not the only kind of adobo. There's multiple kinds of adobo, and it varies from household to household. From region to region, so that really is a really a very tough thing、uh, to quantify, like in in a simple way. You know what I mean? It's like,、yeah. where are you from? How did you grow up? At what era did you grow up? You know, it's it, that kind of a thing. Yeah, exactly. Like the, like the food that my mom grew up eating in the Philippines when she lived there is not the food that is necessarily being eaten in the Philippines now, right? Because it's also a weird like time machine, which is kind of like what I do with the Lola Flora character. Like it's. The food that you know and the and the country that you knew is not the same place anymore, right? Like my mom left when she was twelve, 
right? It's a very different place now mm. in many different ways. And, and that includes the food. Um, there are things that when she goes back, she's like, it doesn't exist anymore. Or like, or like it, it does, but it's changed in such a way. She was like, oh, but that's not like, oh, that's not how they make it anymore. This is how we have it. And she's like, ah, oh. you know, like, so it's, it's really hard to talk, like availability, things like that. And yeah, I mean, like like you mentioned in essence, Filipino cuisine is quite like halo halo. It's a like literally mix mix, right? Yeah. And I'm wondering, have you ever come across people who have never had Filipino cuisine before? And would they have some sort of weird questions or like misconceptions about what Filipino cuisine is? Lots of people have never tried Filipino food before, which is why. So in my books, I have this like there, there's this like line that I walk and people ask me of like, how much am I going to explain? Because I feel, it, on, in many ways, I'm like, I feel like I shouldn't have to explain too much mm. because, like, the internet exists, right? <laughs> like, if you don't know what something is, you can look it up. My character knows what these things are, and it's a first-person point of view. So, like, it wouldn't make sense necessarily to have to go into so much explanation. Uh, particularly because, you know, I'm, you know, I'm salty about the ways that, you know, a lot of, like, Western culture, like, it, like is not expected to have to explain things even if it's not... Uh, a, a white Western culture, I should say, is <laughs> not, you know, um, they don't feel the need to explain to us, even if you're not necessarily part of it. And so I'm like, why should I have to? Um, you know, like I, like, I like to bring up, like, you know, Jane Eyre has, like, entire swaths in untranslated French, you know, like, not like a sentence or a word the way that I do it, like, literal paragraphs where I'm like, well, I guess I'm just going to skim this part. Um, and, and they're like, yeah deal with it you know like that it was expected like if you like if you were educated you should know this kind of a thing and so like there, that's part of it that's why i don't italicize but at the same time i also feel like i i'm not only writing this for filipino and, and also you know what not all filipino readers know what these things are again because it's regional because we have different words for different types of food um, you know, like, they'll talk, like I'll be talking about one food and they'll be like, what? And they're like, oh, you mean this? Because it goes by a completely different name in their region. And so like, if I describe what it is, they'll know what that, what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's also like, well, you know, not everyone is in my head. They can't know what I'm thinking. And so like, I, I walk a line of like, I will use context. Um, maybe, you know, again, it's in a restaurant setting. If someone is like, oh, can you please explain what this menu item is? Then it feels natural to explain it because I want these foods to sound delicious. I don't want them to be like mysterious and exotic, mm -hmm. right? Because it's exotic to who? Not to me. I grew up eating it. But, you know, people are afraid of things that they don't know. So I want them to show like there's nothing weird or strange. It's meat heavy. There's a lot of coconut based things like we, we use like fish sauce. Like there's so like, you know, there are like these things that I'll drop in. So that people will slowly become more familiar with the idea of it and be like, oh, wow, that sounds great. I wish there was a restaurant by me. I would love to try this. You know, I've had readers message me and be like, you know, I drove to the next town over because I've never had Filipino food and I really wanted to try it. And I was like, oh, that's so great. Thank you. That's amazing. <laughs> you know, yeah. things like that. Yeah, I love how you actually tap into that education piece a little bit with your books. I really appreciate how you actually, for each of the book, you included a glossary of different Tagalog terms. So I actually learned some of those. I mean, I kind of knew some of them, but then I learned some of the new terms and then I used that to like impress my Filipino friends. <laughs> And then I just yeah. recently learned, apparently, like, oh, my gulai. Gulai means vegetable. Like, I've heard that so many yeah. times, but um, I just learned that, oh, that means vegetable. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's so interesting. And if I would like to invite you to summarize, what can people learn about Filipino or Filipino-American culture through its cuisine? Like, what will be your take on this? Ooh, that's interesting. Especially interesting because we're, ha like, we're having this conversation like right after the James Beard Awards. Mm -hmm. And we're, um, so in Chicago, there is a restaurant called Kasama, which is the first Filipino restaurant to get a Michelin star. And the owners also, like, I, think, I believe they just won a James Beard Award and there were multiple uh, Filipino chefs in the U.S. that won it. So it's just like, what is Filipino cuisine? What is Filipino cuisine in the U.S.? It's, it's a shifting thing, right? And so there are periods, and it's like, like part of it, like I, I mentioned in, in my first book, Arsene Agro, the ideas of like what is authentic. Mm -hmm. And the idea of like of like authenticity being a gatekeeper in some ways, uh, and you know, and being closed minded because what? Because like you mentioned, like what I ate growing up, right? So like my grandparents and parents, you know, immigrated to the U.S. in the '70s and the '80s, 
And, you know, my father and my grandparents were still cooking Filipino food, but obviously they didn't have access to the kinds of, you know, ingredients they would have gotten back there. So, like, is you know, was my father's, you know, um, bistec and buns, like, inauthentic because we used lemon instead of calamansi? Mm-hmm. Like, well, we didn't have access to calamansi, you know? Um, that we use this particular fish instead of that fish that you're supposed to use? Well, well, that fish doesn't exist, or it didn't at the time, exist in Chicago in the 80s, you know? Diaspora cuisine is kind of its own thing. Mm-hmm. And so I think there's a, there, like, because there's this part where it's just like, are you, like, respecting what it is while still trying and in, in, in try and innovate in different ways? Because there are also people who are like, oh, we need to elevate it, as if, like, there's something wrong with it. Um, like, well, like that's another that way you're putting like gummy bears in your hollow hollow. And I'm like, oh, like that, that, that just ruins things texturally. You know what I mean? Um, or are you like thinking on the various possibilities of like, this is what's at the heart of it. This is what it could be. Uh, this is my take on it. And I think that's really fascinating. Um, my mom, me and my mom have like, like my mom is very kind of old school about it. We've ta- like, we, we know not to take her anymore. <laughs> To the, to the more expensive upscale Filipino eateries in Chicago, she just wants that home cooking. Mm. Like, she like, she like that, she likes you that Lola Flora. She's like, this is how it's supposed to taste. <laughs> this is how it's always tasted. That's what I want. Wait, how much is it? Oh, absolutely not. You know, like, so she's, so, th- so that's like an ongoing conversation of, you know, cause it's also, cause like there's this weird thing of like what people are willing to pay mm. for our cuisine. Right. Because people are willing to pay premium for like French cuisine. Um, and, and it's gotten to a point like people are willing to pay premium for like sushi and other th- like ideas of like global elevated things. But the idea of paying for like, you know, like people get like incensed like the price of tacos as of like Mexican food does not deserve, a, you know, a certain, you know, that it doesn't come with a certain level of expertise. And like, you know, Chinese food, like if we go to like a Chinese joint, you're like, oh, oh. You're charging me how much for these dumplings? And, you know, and it's just like, well, do you know how much work goes into them? Like, do you know what the price of food is right now? Um, so I think there's also a little bit of that yeah. where people have in their minds, like, no, this is a cheap cuisine. You're not supposed to be charging these prices. And there's a weird back. I know I'm not 100% answering you, but th- th- these are the conversations I have in my head. Mm-hmm. These are the conversations I have with other people. These are the conversations I have in my writing or in the things that I read. Um, because there, there's this amazing, uh, well, there, there was, she, she's passed, uh, Doreen Fernandez. She was a Filipino food writer. And so, like, her question was, like, the question is, like, I'm going to paraphrase, like, the question isn't what is Filipino food, but how does a food become Filipino? Mm-hmm. And, um, and, th- and, and it goes up to the of colonization, right? Like, it's like banana ketchup, right? So, you, um, that, uh, like, how is spam and, and other things like that, like, they don't come you know, Filipino spaghetti, like those things were not inherently Filipino, but they came to the Philippines and became Filipino for various reasons. Um, And I think it also works that way in the U.S., Mm -hmm. right? Like it's sometimes out of necessity, right? Again, like those didn't exist at that time or just out of innovation. Um, So again, like I'm, I'm not like talking around your question. It's it is something that I engage with all the time. But I that's my favorite quote to use when I'm thinking, when people ask me, what is Filipino food? It's, it's that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> How does it become Filipino and why? You raised really good points. First, you raised the point that sometimes, you know, like someone's authentic is not someone else's authentic. In mm-hmm. a sense, it's like context matters, right? Because maybe sometimes like they can't do it in like a traditional authentic way because they just didn't have access to that ingredient. They had to like improvise. And at the same time, it's like you mentioned that bias about some, you know, Asian cuisines, especially Southeast Asian cuisines as opposed to be cheap, which was kind of highlighted Mm -hmm. in our probably Asian Foods Month last year as well where this Burmese restaurant owner would always get questions about oh shouldn't Burmese food be cheap like why am I paying this much (laughs) but then he raised a really good point in the sense of like if you're willing to pay this much for a hamburger why wouldn't you be willing to pay this much for like Burmese food right yeah like you're gonna go to a pub and pay like 15 20 dollars for a burger and fries but like this no it's too much yeah and then when they have to pay five dollars for Momo they would be like oh this is too expensive Mm -hmm. (laughs) but one thing that everyone could agree if they have tried Filipino cuisines or they have been to like a Filipino party is that no one will ever leave a Filipino party hungry. (laughs) Is that right? (laughs) (laughs) It's like to the point where so again, like I did like my community, like the neighborhood that I grew up in was not Filipino, but my parents had Filipino friends that lived in the suburbs who were were a little bit more well to do than us. And that's actually how I got the idea of, of Lila, because 
you know, because um, like the the town I created is, it is I based it on a particular Chicago suburb, which some people have guessed correctly. And so this weird, you know, the, the, the idea that we're not monoliths, right? So like I, me and my brothers had a very particular childhood and background and growing up. And then we would go to these Filipino parties, you know, like in the summertime for barbecues or at Christmas time with my family, with my, my parents, because it was their friends and their style of living, uh, their, you know, their interests, the way they talk, the way they all got a lot, like, because they were in a majority white suburb, but they had a huge family. So they had a large community that they were able to be in touch with. And so, like, we always felt like a little, like, again, part of it could just be, like, you know, on us. Like, no one made us feel like we weren't welcome. But you could not help but feel. Part of it was obviously a class divide. Um, but, like, we would go there and be like, oh, this is different. <laughs> it's not, you know, kind of, like, the same thing. And, um, oh, shoot, I, I, sorry, I forgot, like, the original question. But it, that's basically... Um, how I got the idea of the town and and how and how where like it was almost like a thought experiment you mm -hmm. know like the nature versus nurture like who would I be if I was born and raised in a different setting True. and so Lila was my thought experiment of like okay if I was born in this kind of like a suburban small town setting that is majority white but I had a close loving tight-knit Filipino community to grow up within how would I change and how would I be the same? And that's how like she was created. Yeah. And I love how you, in the book, you capture the essence of Filipino culture in the sense of Tita Rosie's restaurant and or at her dinner parties. Everyone's welcome. Everyone from all sorts mm -hmm. of cultures are welcome, which was essentially me as an outsider whenever I attend any sort of Filipino parties. That's how I felt. No one would ever tell me that, oh, you don't know this food, so you shouldn't be eating this or like, this is too good for you. I just genuinely felt so welcome as a non-Filipino whenever I join a Filipino party, which was something that you nicely captured. So, like, again, I would go there, like, we expect tons of food, and you always brought food back home with you, right? So I grew up for the longest time thinking, like, if you go to parties, you're supposed to be able to bring a plate home, right? So when I got older, and, like, I would go to people, like, from different cultures, and, like, where's the food? Or, like, or like there would only be enough for a little bit, and I'd be like, oh, I, I can't take food home. They're like, why would you take food home? And I was like, that's not, that's not a thing. <laughs> Because it's all like, and also like in Latin cultures, it's very often like, here, eat, eat, you know. So like, you, I would go to like my best friends, like they're having a barbecue down the block. I would go there and I'd be able to bring a plate of like rice and antenna to like for my family. Like it was expected that you would leave with food. And so for the longest time, that has like skewed my idea of like what a party is supposed to be. Mm. Um, and you know now like because I host for the holidays because uh, so I'm actually in the burbs now I'm just outside the city but my entire family is still in the city so I have a house I have parking <laughs> that you don't get there and so like when I cook like I'm like my husband's like I think we'll be okay because my husband's like and I'm like no you don't understand we can't just have enough we have to have leftovers to eat for a few days people have to take food home like no this is not fine <laughs> and like. It's a thing. It's at it, I guess. For sure. <laughs> because of the way I grew up, it's really, really ingrained in my head what hosting is. Yeah, it's the best part. <laughs> um, but now it's time for us to move on to the next segment, which is called Rapid Fires. <laughs> And in this segment, I'll be asking my guests biased questions that they've got asked at some point in life. And in this case, biased questions people have about Filipino cuisine, its culture, or even some questions that Nia yourself got. So are you ready? As ready as I'll ever be. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go. The first one is the classic. Where are you really from? And I've gotten so many, like, you know, like I'm sure like every, just about every guest you've had has gotten that in some way. But mine has always been like really confused because I'm like, like again, I know how I look. I'm, I'm just very ambiguous. So I'm always like, where are you from? I'm like, I'll be like, Chicago. And they're like, no, but like, where are you really from? I'm like, Chicago. <laughs> and then they're like, oh yeah, but I'm like, and then, it's, you know, then I'll be like, oh, I'm from a neighborhood called Hermosa. Have you heard of it? Yeah, and they're like, what? no, but like, where, uh, where are your parents from? I'm like, why didn't you ask that? Like, is that what you wanted to know? Why didn't you ask that question first? And they're like, oh, oh. And I'm like. <laughs> like, but like, when I was younger, I'd be like, oh, my family's from the Philippines. But now as I've gotten older, I'd be like, I would, I'll just lean in, like eye contact, like Chicago. I already told you, Chicago. 
it's where I was born and raised. Where else could I be from? You know, like I will lean real, like make them uncomfortable until they realize what it is they're asking. Yeah, it's not gonna change. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no matter how many times they ask, it's still gonna be the same answer. <laughs> It's still the same place. Like I got my birth certificate. Do you want to see? Like it's very clearly said. Yeah. And、um, the next question is, if you are Filipino, why do you look like that? Because like a lot of people will, when I tell them, like finally I'll be like, oh, my parents are originally from the Philippines, or like you're like, or like, or they'll speak to me in a party line, like, oh, I don't speak that. I'm Filipino, and they're like, no, you're not. Like they will not believe me. Like they'll like they know better. I don't know who and what I am. And, you know, and sometimes I'll just be like colonization. <laughs> I don't know. Like I, I can't really like because they'll all, they'll all assume I'm mixed at least. Like oh, okay, so Filipino and then I'm like and Filipino, and then they're just like and then I'm like no.、Uh, like like if you go far back enough, I think my great grandmother is mestiza. Like so like Spanish and Filipino, but that's like a little while back、yeah. to be looking this way. And I'm just like we're not monoliths. We all look different and you know for various reasons. And they're just like oh okay I'm like. Yeah, well, I'm curious. What's a Filipino supposed to look like, like according to them? Exactly.、Yeah. And I've actually asked them, like, I don't know what am I supposed to look like, and they're just like, Oh, I don't know. We're little. Like, <laughs> and why don't Filipinos use chopsticks? I thought all Asians used chopsticks. So there was a scene in Arsene Nadobo, like, they, like they were not that blatant.、Uh, although I've heard people ask, like, like, but like in a genuinely questioning, like, Oh, I thought everyone used chops. Like, not like a, could, but with the.、Um, I was at a Filipino restaurant with my family one time, and then there was like a non-Filipino,、um, pretty white couple, like like sitting next to us, and they asked the server for chopsticks. And like I guess the server was so used to that question, like they actually did just get like disposable chopsticks. But I, like me and my family were sitting there, and we were like, what? Because like in Philippines, like do you use like forks and spoons, or you use your hands?、Yeah. Like you, like you know, depending on where you are and like what the occasion is. We don't use chopsticks historically, right? Like I can use, I I can use them because I I lived in Korea for a while in various ways. But like it's not a Filipino thing. Like oh, you're in an Asian restaurant, so you think asking for chopsticks makes you like more cool and authentic. And I'm like, that's not how we eat our food.、Uh, which is why like I had like the food critic in my first book ask for chopsticks and be like, what do you mean you don't use chopsticks? Why? Because I've had people ask, like, why don't you use chopsticks? Like, why don't Filipinos do that? And I'm like, they just don't. <laughs> they just don't. Yeah. So like, that's why I had her. Just, she's like, you know, she's like, I serve food, not history lessons. You want to know? Google it. Like, why would I know those things? You look it up. You are the one who is interested. Exactly. But I mean, um, just a fun question for you. In the never-ending debate of fork or chopsticks, what would you pick? It depends on what I'm eating. Um, if it's noodles, chopsticks. Um, I like, like the one thing that people are like, really, you want chopsticks for that salad? So like when I was, cause like sometimes like a fork, like you're just stabbing at those lettuces, and like it's not really like spearing the way it's supposed to, and like I'm I'm just like kind of scooping weirdly. Chopsticks pick it up easily.、Oh, my mind、yeah. just blown. <laughs> <laughs> But carrying on with the rapid bias questions, the next one is, why is Filipino food so bland? Which like. I didn't know people thought that until、um, someone shared like an article on Twitter. Like you know, like those really annoying. Like rank the Asian cuisine. Like how do you rank a quiz? Like the cuisines in Asia. Like that is impossible because taste is so subjective. But whatever. But there was one that said like Filipino food was like the least delicious according to these travelers. And a lot, like a lot of the comments in that section were talking about how bland Filipino food was. I was like, one, where are you eating? Because. Like it's like the opposite of bland. That's what I've had it. And then she's like, okay, there a, a lot of cuisine also relies on condiments. A certain you know, so like when we serve certain things, we also give you like patis, which is like fish sauce, or like calamansi, or like、uh, salsawan, or like other various dipping sauces, which are made like of like soy sauce or vinegar or fish sauce and chilies, all these different kinds, because you know we want you to season to your palate, kind of a thing. So. Most foods will come generously seasoned, but there are some like like with grilled fish、mm. in particular, or like or like simple dishes will come with those those various sauces, so you can season it the way you like.、And、I was like, that's the only way I could see someone calling our food bland is because oh, you are not using the sauces you're supposed to use. You're just using you're eating like a plain piece of meat or fish and plain rice. Like you you don't get how to eat our food is the problem.、Um, 
But like, yeah, when someone told me like, oh, Filipino food is bland, I was like, <laughs> where are you eating? It, it was like, it, it blew my mind reading that article. I was like, I don't know where these people are, but <laughs> not at my house, that's for sure. Did they perhaps mistake British foods for Filipino foods for that article? <laughs> It was wild reading so many comments saying that. And I was like, I don't understand. I don't understand. Yeah. And finally, in <laughs> Rapid Bias, why do your characters have to be Filipino if it's not important to the story? Yeah, like someone said in a critique before, it's like, well, like, why? Why do they have to? Like, you know, because like, the idea, because like, you were asking, like, uh, as I've never accused of being of too Asian, you'll be amazed at how many times people of color have been like, oh, they're not X enough. You know, I've had a friend who it took her over 20 years to get published because her her characters weren't black enough. Her as a black woman writing black female characters. You know, my my character's like, you know, like I'm like I don't wake up Filipino Lee and brush my Filipino hair and wash my Filipino like 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 we do not just we just kind of exist in the world. You know what I mean? And so do my characters. Where like our background informs who we are and how the world sees us, but we're we're more than that, <laughs> you know. And then so just like I don't know, like she didn't have to be Filipino. What does it change? And like everything in some ways, and, and nothing in others. Mm. And like why why can't they be exactly? And they are just people. We're just people. Yeah. So thank you for playing this round of rapid bias. <laughs> For us to conclude the episode, I'm so curious, what's next for you? Tell us about your upcoming book, and I'm so glad that you're actually writing book five. <laughs> I have to work far in advance. So book four in the series Murder and Momon comes out September 19th of this year. Uh, this one features the calendar crew in a very... So, like, the calendar crew are... Um, the, the aunties, the godmother figures in Lila's life, they are a lot of people's favorite characters. They're actually my favorite to write. Not my favorite to experience in real life, because obviously, like... Um, these are not based on any one person. My characters are never really based on any one person, for the most part. They're, they're more amalgamations of people and experiences, and the aunties in particular are like every auntie you've ever met in your life in various ways. Um, but here the tables are turned because usually they're her source of information, right? Mm -hmm. They all the gossips. They know everything about everybody. But in book four, it seems like they... Someone close to them is murdered, and it looks like they might be next. It looks like they're being targeted. So now Lila has to be nosy and delve into their lives and find out their secrets to see why someone might be coming after them and catch the killer before someone she loves gets hurt. And so it was a very interesting take because before in the other book, it's her, her or her loved one being accused of murder and trying to prove herself innocent. This is like, oh, no, I need to find out who is threatening my godmothers before it's too late mm -hmm. because they've already killed. Their, they, it looks like they might kill again. Mm -hmm kind of a thing um and book five is something i'm currently writing right now yeah Yay. i mean it sounds really tense and thrillery and suspense it's not it's still like i was literally googling like dog costumes like how am i gonna dress up longanista like <gasps> yeah. it's still very much a cozy right it's still very cozy yeah. and cute but the idea but the, but the idea behind lila's motiva motivations for the investigation are different that's what i'm trying to get across yeah. it's not like oh there's a ticking clock she's got it like it's not like it's not like that intense honestly yeah if anything i'm actually so curious to learn more about the backstory of the calendar crew so hopefully i'll yeah. get to learn more in book four um and finally Finally, before we leave, I just have one last question for you, Mia. What does it mean to be proudly Filipino American to you? Oh, when I talk to other Filipinos and, and also especially like Filipino creatives, something that surprised me was like how many of them didn't feel Filipino enough. And so for me, I think because of just my personality and the way I grew up, I never had that i felt like because so many people were trying to tell me oh you're not filipino you're not really filipino i was like you don't get to tell me who i am i know who i am and so for me like it's, it's almost been like the opposite me very like aggressively being like i know who i am you can't tell me otherwise and so for me that that's what it's being probably like not letting others um gatekeep again mm -hmm. like I, I used it earlier but like it's very much like gatekeep what my identity is get who gets who gets to be filipino what filipino means what being asian american means um i get to decide that for myself 
And so, and I hope other people who have the same thing, like, oh, like, am I like, if you are mixed, if you are in an area that's majority not Asian, if you grew up, you know, not really having those cultural touch, like, I, again, I at least had my family keeping me, you know, pointing me, like, letting me know who I am and, what, and where we came from. Not everybody has that, but I want you to know, like, it's, you don't have to have grown up that way to, you know, be really Asian. You can start as an adult. Like, there's so much I don't know about Filipino history that I'm learning as an adult because it wasn't taught in schools. I want to know. And my curiosity is leading me to learn more and more about myself, right? I, I was never, like, I was never less Filipino because I knew that, but I want to be a more well-rounded one uh, by, by exploring my curiosities. So I, I hope other people who feel that way, like, they're not enough. Like, that's, there is no measure mm -hmm. for that. Exactly. You are you and they can't take that away from you. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for joining us on Proudly Asian. It was such a fascinating conversation. Yeah, thank you. That's it for this episode of Proudly Asian. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at proudly.asian for more content. We are on Spotify, Apple Podcasts and YouTube. Leave us a five-star review on wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for tuning in and signing off for now. I'm Isabel Wong. Just, just, just.